everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started on time. Um, so if you could all join me to uh, say the pledge. Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well, thank you all again for coming out today. Um, we look forward to hearing from everyone. Um, I'm Delegate April Rose, uh, here, serve here in District 5, and um, I am the current delegation chair along with my co-chair, um, Senator Reedy. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, the, our first order of business today will be the adoption of our rules. Um, all of our members. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. No, it's, okay. it's my first me running this meeting. <laughs> Let's have everyone introduce themselves because we have some new members. I'm Josh Stanko from District 42C. You were already on, I think. I was on, okay. I'm Chris West from District 42 in general. <laughs> Senator Justin Reedy representing District 5. Delegate Rose. Delegate Chris Tomlinson, District 5. Delegate Eric Boucher, District 5. Okay. Do people know what these districts are? Probably not. Give them a, a one sentence. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. So, I'm all about so, your <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, District 5 is the entire county except for District 42. And District 42, if you imagine a triangle going from Hampstead to Westminster to Finksburg, that's sort of District 42. Um, it's a so. little bit like a mandible claw, though, uh, but it is, it is a triangle. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you, um, Senator West. And we're happy to have. Um, uh, uh, delegate Stanko join us so we now have an extra delegate and uh, and Senator West so that's very nice um, so again um, our first order of business today will be the adoption of our delegation rules which our delegation had all received um, so I don't know if, if anybody has a question or if you uh, motion. we would entertain a motion entertain a motion to accept our rules a motion to accept the rules I'll second it any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. <laughs> okay. So we now have rules. That's good. Um, <laughs> our first um, order of business on our agenda would be the request from our Carroll County Commissioners. And I believe uh, Mr. Fowler was going to come. Oh, oh okay. Very good. And as he's coming to the microphone, as we have everyone um, uh, testify today, um, doesn't necessarily mean you because I know you have a lot of information usually for us but uh, we're going to try to keep it to about three minutes so that we can uh, be mindful of everyone's time today and uh, we'll kind of go from there. Go ahead. So Mr. We don't Lewis. have to take a lot of time. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Not for this one anyway. <laughs> uh, for, for new members I'm Ted Zaleski. I'm the Director of Management and Budget for the county and also what we're doing here uh, Carroll County to issue debt has to come to the General Assembly for approval so each year we send you a number to put into the legislation that we've used for many years now. Um, oh yeah, if, if you'd rather have Mike Fowler, I can bring, okay. him, bring him up. Yeah. You're uh, doing great, Ted. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you've done this before. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so this year uh, we are asking for $65.6 .6 million. Oh, okay. uh, that's based on the CIP as it exists now, knowing that we still have work to do with the commissioners ahead of us. Uh, we have historically given you uh, a letter and a, uh, a spreadsheet that shows the project that this is based on. I have those with me today. We can mail it like we usually do, or we can leave it behind for you, you know, whatever you would prefer. That's, that's really all there is to say. We'll get that from you. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Does anybody have any questions for Mr. Zolosky? Okay. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, next on our agenda would be the request from our Board of License Commissioners, our Liquor Board. Good afternoon, members of the delegation. I'm Dave Browning, Chairman of the Carroll County Board of License Commission. We have introduced two bills for your consideration. The first bill, I think you have both of them before you, 3LR842, 
is a bill to allow seating of 15 seats at the bar to satisfy a restaurant of 50 seats or more. The second bill, 3LR0851, is a bill to allow a increase in fees for a class as well as add a class for over 40 events per year. Primarily, this class is only applicable to fire companies and the Carroll County Arts Center. The Arts Center has been a user of the increased class of up to 40 events per year. Over that, they have had to get a one-day license. A one-day license is $50. They have had, in their fiscal year to date, 40 events, which satisfies their license of, of, of uh, 31 to 40 events per year at a fee of $500. They have scheduled 44 additional events. Under the current licensing, they would be required to get a one-day license at a fee of $50. As you can see, that far exceeds the classification that this bill would allow them all events 41 and over for a fee of $2,000. At the present time, based upon those figures, they would pay well over four. Is there anyone else that would be, I'm sorry, can I ask a question? Ahead. Is there anyone else who would be doing more than, it's probably just them? They are the point? only one. The various license fees are based on zero to 10 events, which we have 10 fire companies. 11 to 20 events, which we have two fire companies. 21, 31, 31 to 40, we have zero, and one over 40, which is Manchester Fire Company. And you were going to expand. I, could you expand on the, the, the increases in the fees for the, the lower license? You, you would talk to us, I think a couple of us offline. Can you talk a little bit about the reason for that? And The, the reason for that is a one-day license is $50. You can have, under this classification, 10 events for $125, which is one-fourth of what it would cost for any other nonprofits to have the same 10 events. Same way with uh, 11 to 20 and so on and so forth. The highest fee that we charge under other classifications is $2,250. We had two public hearings with no opposition to the $2,000 fee that we are proposing for over 41 events. Thank you. Does anyone else have any other questions? Senator West. Hi, uh, I'm, a, I'm a lawyer, so I read texts carefully. <laughs> um, you have to put up with me. So uh, it looks at, to me as if the, the change in the seating requirement would be um, restaurants could have regular seating at tables including not more than 15 seats at bars and counters for at least 50 individuals. Are there any restaurants already in the county that have currently more than 15 seats at bars and counters that would have to reduce their seating as a result of this? Senator, currently there are no seating allowed at bars. No, none, okay. None. So this we, would allow up to 15 seats. We have seats. several establishments that are rather cramped for 50 seats. This would allow them to use up to 15 seats at the bar to satisfy the 50 seating. Good, okay, thanks. Thank you. Great. Okay. What kind of uh, license <clears throat> does the Art Center have right now? They have the same as all the FAR companies. Under the, the classifications, the only license are available under that classification are fire companies and the Carroll Art Center. Okay. There are 14 fire companies, but only 13 have a license. It's a Class C license as present. 
Okay. Yeah, because I, I mean, I've been there, and I know when they have movies and whatnot. I mean, they'll sell like some wine or something. Okay. The uh, the request for this came from the art center. Oh, okay. They requested that because last year they paid like thirty three hundred dollars in fees. When you pay thousand dollars in fees and everything over that fifty bucks, and they had over a hundred events, it adds up. If I might, Chairman Brawny, it's always good to see you. Thanks for being here today. Would you happen to know how long ago the last time these fees were raised, the annual three, license and Over fee? three decades ago, over 30 years ago. Well, that's very pertinent. Thank for, thanks for adding that. Yes, sir. Wonderful. Anyone have any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your consideration. Is there anyone else that wants to speak on this issue? Okay. Back trouble. That's why I'm standing up, no, shaking. Fine. No problem. Right. No problem. Thank you, Mr. Brani. Thank you, sir. Okay, we'll move on to the next item of business. Uh, we have a request from the town of Mount Airy. Do we have someone here to present for that? Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. I think we have. Yeah, I think we have. Thanks. No, that's good. Thank you. Thank you. Let me get them a copy too. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for being here, Mayor. Go ahead and. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you so much for having me here. Is this, is this thing suitable? Test us. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks so much for uh, letting me speak up here. The town of Mount Airy is. Once again, trying to seek uh, authorization, urban renewal authority uh, that could be used as a tool. We consider it a uh, an arrow uh, that uh, uh, that exists that that we're able to use to get some dilapidated properties moving. Uh, so that's why we're we're seeking this. There's not a lot of dilapidated properties, but I would tell you in 2020, which is. Uh, what's in that folder that I gave you when we first were asking for this and of course we were under the Frederick delegation at that time uh, We were seeking this and and just the mere uh, Thought of seeking urban renewal authority got got at least one of our projects moving in town So I think it's an important tool for us to have and I would hope that you would support us being able to get that authority Please uh, Mayor, if I may ask, what has been the feel of your constituency on this issue? Uh, constituents are fine on it. Uh, to be honest with you, for quite a while, uh, before we had our current town administrator, we were uh, not aware of urban renewal authority and what its uses could be and uh, how, how we needed to obtain it. Uh, once he came in, he used to work in Chevrolet, so he... Uh, had quite a bit of knowledge about urban renewal authority and once he brought that to our attention we we thought it was an important tool i've had no problem from any constituents who have talked about us uh, obtaining this like i said we're not we're not seeking to go out there and take over any properties uh, or anything along those lines but we would like to have this there to kind of uh, send an alert to a developer who's let a property sit around for two decades and not move on it. Uh, if you've been down to our liquidity ale works, that building sat empty for 18 years. As soon as the, uh, and I'm not saying it's the sole reason, but as soon as we started talking about urban renewal authority, all of a sudden uh, the property moved. And, and now it's a terrific place to go and get a beer if anyone's interested. So, <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes. We have another question, Senator yes. Reedy. Yeah, uh, just for the benefit of the, I was looking at the, um, Look at the bill, and I've seen it before, of course, when Delegate Cox introduced it previously. <coughs> um, it's it's a long bill. Can you talk about how many? Uh, you're, this is not new. The Mount Airy would. Do you know how many other towns in? I I in, believe in it's the state, in the neighborhood roughly. of sixty to uh, somewhere around sixty municipalities. Sixty-seven. Okay. Oh, Delegate Tomlinson said sixty-seven. Okay, I knew it was. I knew it was a good number. So it's yeah. it's something that's been rolled out a lot of places. Yeah, and I believe in the last session, Williamsport and um, and another um, uh, municipality obtained it. At that point, there was some confusion last year 
between the, uh, the Frederick delegation that uh, uh, they kind of pointed a finger at each other and said, well, I thought he was going to do it, and, uh, and it, it went back the other way. So, uh, so it, it almost made it through, and then when it didn't pass, we, uh, uh, I called uh, Senator Huff and Delegate Cox, and they both said, well, I thought he, yeah. he, he didn't want it. And, uh, so, but uh, hopefully the Carroll delegation is on board and, and will get this uh, for us. We also, whatever we vote on, we'll have to, if we were to agree, we also have to get Frederick delegation authorization. Yes. So, I'll, uh, so but we'll probably have to talk to them as well. Yeah, but. and I have talked to uh, members over there, and they seem on board with what we're doing. So Thank you very much. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Anything else? Any other questions? <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, we have now come to the portion of requests from our community organizations. I'm going to go in order from our agenda, and then if there's anyone else. You want me to um, go through the model? Yes, and I'm going to have um, Senator Reedy is going to sort of give an overview and explanation on how the bond initiatives work. Thanks. Um, and I'll, I'll try to avoid the 300 years ago uh, explanation <laughs> of when this all started. But we're. So some of you that are here know this process, or at least somewhat of the process, but these are legislative, they used to be called bond bills, and now they're called legislative bond initiatives. There is a, about, there are roughly $15 million, million, not billion, million dollars set aside in the state's capital budget every year for what's known as legislative bond initiatives. They're specific earmarks for different projects in the community that are not otherwise eligible for other state capital funds, at least normally the idea is you prioritize these projects because they're not usually going to be able to get funding from Maryland Department of the Environment or Maryland Department of Transportation in their capital budgets. Um, and so this is, uh, these are, for $15 million, there are 188 state legislators. So you can imagine it's not, we don't, we don't get handed three or $4 million to hand out. We get, it's, it's, it's competitive and it's, um, and it's uh, selective, it's uh, limited. But it, you don't have our delegation generally what we have always we have done in the past was we would take requests and we would we would decide if we we're going to introduce them sort of as a delegation any individual legislator up here or in the general assembly can introduce a legislative bond initiative on their own uh, so what you were here to present today is, is to present them to us as requests that our delegation not just as a whole but individually can consider um, it is true though internally it's a little it's not a very straight line process it's a little murky we obviously will be asked at times to prioritize, and even when we prioritize the, the capital budget sub, subcommittee chairman in both the House and the Senate, they have a lot of autonomy. So just laying that groundwork for you, this year we have more people on this list, and there's even a couple that of requests that have come in that they won't be here today. We, we, uh, we have more on this list than we've ever really seen in a long time. We don't typically get a chance to, we could put all of them in <laughs> and ask for all of them, but we won't get all of them. So just wanted to set that groundwork, uh, you know, from the beginning. I hate to sound negative, but just to be sure everybody knows. If, if you come today and if we, if, whether we put it in or whether we end up deciding to wait a year, you can always come back. So, you know, we're going to do our best to get as much as we can, but just wanted to make it clear that we, we, we don't get handed three or four million dollars. <laughs> we usually get handed, you know, a few hundred thousand and, and more on the lower end than the higher end of that. So uh, I wanted to lay that groundwork. We do want to hear from everybody today and, and see kind of what, what the project is and how we can be helpful. And I think actually, um, Chairwoman Rose, we, we have one that the Farm Museum is not coming today, so we can strike them off the, okay. the list. Um, but we'll start, we actually were going to start with the mayor of Mount Airy here. Uh, you got to sit down and take a break and now you can come back up. Since you were going to be up, we were going to start with you. Uh, you had two projects, um, so uh, potentially as potential LBIs, so go, go right uh, ahead. Yes, and I have some good news for all the municipalities and you as well. <laughs> I sat down with my town administrator and we went through those two projects. The Flatiron Building, which we definitely would love to restore, we don't consider it shovel ready because we still have a council vote on the floor that says that uh, three out of five council members desired to demolish a building. So that's something that I have to deal with over the next year. What I would ask for is support in grant funding uh, as we go through this in terms of uh, uh, if we apply for grants, I'd love to have a, a letter from uh, the 
delegation or from each of you separately uh, supporting whatever grants we apply for on that building. Um, I might as well jump right into your second issue, which is uh, uh, we initially were looking for some money for uh, Rails to Trails, uh, which is a great project in town, once again, uh, uh, terrific. Uh, we, uh, in talking with the town administrator, I might have jumped on that one too, a little bit early. So we're gonna be looking at program open space land acquisition uh, for a property that we're looking at and i would tell you it's unique in that it's uh the pro uh, the county line goes right through the middle of it between uh, frederick and carroll county so that either opens up an opportunity or slams a door i'm not sure which <laughs> but well, uh well at the very least you got to have a nice infomercial for everything going on with mount airy yes, by being here today and, so that's and what i <laughs> am able to do is prep you for next year <laughs> when we come back and it's good news for everybody sitting here that is here for a bond initiative because there's two less projects we have to consider. So that's all, all very good. So thank right. you very much for coming and thank we'll, we'll so be in much. touch about those other items. Thank okay. you. Okay. Um, you mentioned the Farm Museum is not here today. So we will move forward to, yeah. oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, it's good. This Nathan one. Baker Foundation Playground, Nate's Place in Sykesville. And do please introduce yourself for yes. the record when you come up, thanks. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Nick Shakti, and I'm here today as the Vice President of the Nathan Chris Baker Foundation. Uh, on behalf of Justin and Katie Baker and the Foundation, we are here today to request supplemental funding for our current and capstone project. We're working collaborative, collaboratively to build a unique playground that will be named Nate's Place at Freedom Park in Sykesville. It's always been a dream of Nate's family and the Nathan Chris Baker Foundation to build a playground in Nate's honor. We are now making that dream a reality. Nate's Place will be NCBF's last major project after more than 10 years of supporting our community. We're currently engaged in a memorandum of understanding with Carroll County Rec and Parks to provide a minimum of $100,000 to create an obstacle course style and destination playground. Rec and Parks, um, excuse me, um, Rec and Parks has partnered with an anonymous donor willing to match up to $200,000 for every dollar uh, we raise for the playground. If we meet our goals, a $400,000 playground will be installed at Freedom Park in Sykesville. We've already given $50,000 towards the project in 22, and we're confident we will raise another fifty dollars to $75,000 in the coming months. We're here today to request additional funding to get us closer to the $200,000 goal so we can benefit from the full matching amount from the anonymous donor. Over the past years, the Nathan Chris Baker Foundation has donated over $350,000 to our local community for playgrounds, athletic fields, and scoreboards in addition to providing financial, physical, and emotional support to families in our community. The vision of NCBF is to empower communities with strength, resources, and hope needed to go out and be great, our message. Nate's Place at Freedom Park in Sykesville will do just that. Thank you for your time, and if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. We also have information on our website about our foundation and um, our, our project, Nate's Place. Thank you. I did have one question. You kind of ran through it really quickly. Um, so, how close are you currently to the two hundred thousand? We've 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 already committed. We've already made a, a donation of fifty thousand dollars, and we expect in the coming months to do another fifty to seventy-five. Um, so that'll put us at at one twenty-five. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Any other questions? Okay. Thank you very much for being here today. Okay, uh, the Farm Museum again, not here today. Uh, so we are now up to um, our friends at the Ark of Carroll County. Well, good afternoon. My name is Don Rahm, the Executive Director at the, the Ark Carroll County. It's a pleasure to be with you this afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm here today with Corinne Corpus, our Board President, and Jen Most, our Director of Development, who will also be uh, sharing a few brief words about uh, our project. Uh, for those of you that don't know or aren't aware, the ARC um, supports about a little over 600 adults and children in Carroll County, and we do that through a variety of different programs, employment programs, and vocational programs, transportation programs, and we also have a nice collaboration with Carroll County Public Schools. But what we're here today to talk about and to request is really for our residential program. And to help me talk a little bit more about that project, I want to introduce Jen Most, our Director of Development. Good afternoon. Thank you for your time. I'm Jen Most. I'm the Director of Development with the Art Carroll County. 
Um, the reason that we're here today is the ARC in our service of developmentally disabled adults and children. We own eight homes in Carroll County. Um, in those homes, approximately three residents reside that are not related. And uh, during the recent pandemic, it, was, it became keenly aware of the restoration and repair as well as quality of life upgrades that were necessary to those homes. Um, the ARC maintains the care of the homes just as it would a family home in the community. Uh, and we provide not only 24 seven care for the individuals that live there, but also all of their transportation services. Uh, during the pandemic, the residents were home all day, every day. Uh, the amount of use, wear and tear increased drastically and the homes welcomed visitors so that the individuals that we served weren't isolated. And when in welcoming those visitors, there was a increase in use to our patios, decks, um, and such. As a result, the repairs and the quality of life renovations are primarily structural related to accessibility and independence. So it's actually the opportunity for them to get in and out of their own homes through their ramps and through their decks. Uh, additionally, it was identified that there are many quality of life repairs that are necessary for an aging population. During being very mindful of the age and the ability of the individuals that we serve and to participate fully in their lives, we wanted to rectify the limitations by lowering countertops for our new wheelchair use individuals that didn't use wheelchairs in the past. Uh, we want to create adaptive sinks. We need to provide you know, recessed cabinetry so that those individuals can actually roll up to their kitchen and assist in the meal preparation so that they have a full empowered ability to participate in their own life instead of just the assignment of. Um, the changes would allow our individuals to take a more active role in their daily living, uh, including the improvement of their quality of life. The necessary renovations and repairs are beyond the traditional scope of cost care reimbursement. And so therefore we are turning to our donors, our community, our legislators and our families for support uh, to assist us in making those repairs so that the individuals that we serve through no fault of their own uh, can live the most empowered and beneficial life that we can offer. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. And I just, I'd like to introduce uh, Corinne Corpus, our board president, to talk a little bit about the, the board support and some other support that we have as well. Good afternoon. Thank you for having us today. Um, I, I appreciate this opportunity to make this much needed request for our organization. As a volunteer with the ARC, I'm so proud of our commitment to making sure that the people that have selected the ARC to receive our services receive the best care and opportunities to be independent, and we want to make sure that they're fully engaged in the life of our community. Our board is fully committed to this project, and we are actively working to raise money through um, not only the bond funding, but um, with our donors and our found other foundations. So we really um, are working hard to make sure that we get all the funding in addition to the bond that we're asking for. Uh, we greatly appreciate your continued support and consideration, and we look forward to working with you to fully fund this effort. Thank you again for the opportunity. Again, just uh, thank you for, for hearing us this afternoon. Um, I also wanted to share, too, that, you know, the ARC is supported by about 250 just truly amazing staff members, many of whom work in these homes, and so they see the impact that they have on the lives of folks, and so we just, we want to make sure that, um, you know, that their work uh, is able, that they've got the um, tools and uh, things necessary to do the work that they do. So we'd be happy to answer any questions. Mr. Royal, I just want to state that what you and your organization does is truly blessed work and we're all very grateful in this community for what you do because it would be a burden upon the rest of the community if you weren't there doing what you do. So bless your soul and everything you do for our community. Yeah, thank you for those kind words. You're very welcome. And it was great to see your group in Annapolis, and we're looking forward to getting to see in person yes. your wonderful uh, 
community to come down and see us again. We'll so. be down there. We've got about, uh, I guess, 11 folks. They've been asking for two years. So we're, uh, <laughs> that's good. <laughs> that's a highlight. Yes, it is. Zoom is not the same. No, Zoom is not the same. same. Anyone else? Yeah. Um, oh. uh, roughly speaking, wh where are these eight eight homes? So we have uh, three in Tawny Town and five in Westminster. Okay. Very good. Thanks again for being here today. Okay, we are now ready to hear um, from, if there's someone here today from Carrolltown Elementary School to make a presentation. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Nikki Guinan and I'm the president of Carrolltown Elementary's PTA. I'm here with my treasurer, Scott McCadden. He also has some remarks prepared for you. In July of last year, the majority of Carrolltown's main playground was deemed irreparable and dangerous and was re removed from the grounds. And so what's left right now are pieces that are quickly deteriorating and will also need to re be replaced in the near future. At this time, it's definitely inadequate for the amount of students housed at Carrolltown. I quickly found out that our PTA is responsible for raising the funds for this vital piece of educational equipment and we immediately got to work. I put out a call for help and I assembled a team of parents to tackle this task. We strategized and planned since July to raise the funds so our 650 students have the adequate equipment for our population. I wasn't aware in July how much this would cost, so I want to let you all know this is what I've found out. The equipment only to replace what was removed, not the whole playground, is $165,000. This doesn't include the poured rubber ground cover that would be durable, requires little maintenance, and would make this playground safer and fully accessible to children regardless of ability. This is especially crucial for Carrolltown because we are home to one of the district's early childhood and special needs programs, so we have very many differently able children at our school. Factoring in the cost for the accessible ground cover, our PTA is tasked with raising over $200,000. We've had many restaurant nights, a fun run, silent auctions, a fall festival, a winter carnival, and we have a few more events planned this year. We've explored grants, we've been soliciting corporate donations. Our fun run this year raised just over $50,000, which is pretty remarkable for an elementary school. But we would need to do this three more times to get a playground. Our winter carnival this past Wednesday, just two days ago, where we had thousands of dollars in donations and for which a team of parents has been working tirelessly since September, raked in about $12,000, but we would need 16 more of these to ha have a playground for our kids. We've encountered generosity for sure during this fundraising campaign, but corporations aren't able to shell out enough at this time to make large dent in our budget. We've had just one donor of $10,000 and two uh, for $5,000 plus some small donations. Our families can only afford so much, and so after seven months of fundraising, we just broke the halfway point two days ago. Fatigue is setting in for our parents and our community, and we still need so much more. Our children need this playground to be successful in school, and they deserve to have safe equipment that all of their classmates, regardless of ability, can play on. The surrounding community also deserves this playground for meetups on the weekends and breaks. Carrolltown is a really open area school district. It's very walkable, um, and we get families all through the year who access that playground and also contribute to the wear and tear. So we would need more, we need more durable equipment. As it stands, the children at Carrolltown have done without sufficient equipment this year. And if our current timeline holds, it will be another year without a playground unless you can help us. It's my understanding that the bond we're eligible for and that our principal has put in for is $50,000, which would help us tremendously. It would get us three quarters of the way there. If there's any chance that this could be increased though, perhaps up to 75, to almost match our efforts, it would mean our children could have a playground by this next school year. Please consider us for this worthy, worthy cause. It would add so much value to the lives of the children and families in Carroll, in South Carroll. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I am Scott McCadden. Thank you all for hearing from me today. I'm the treasurer of the Carrolltown Elementary PTA. Um, so as, as Nikki noted, we've, we've been putting in the work. Uh, we've, we've also been saving our money, so just even coming into the year, um, we had been very careful about the way we handle the money that we receive in the form of donations from the community. 
Uh, there's a few small donors, a uh, few large donations we've gotten, but the vast majority of the funds that come into the PTA are from just the working families in the neighborhood. So these are just the parents of the elementary school kids who are putting in, we're talking $200,000, and they're doing it. We're putting in the work. We're, we've got the volunteers. There's lots of eyes on this. Um, it's really amazing how much momentum we have. Um, if, if, the, if there's anything I can say, I understand there's politics involved and that's your specialty, but if there's anything I can say to get that number from 50,000 to 100,000 to match what we've done, it would actually get us to the finish line. And that would be an amazing thing. Um, the, what, as I've uh, taken over this, uh, this role as a treasurer and been talking with other parents in the community, people are shocked to find out that the playground is something that this, like, the school doesn't get the money for. Like everything else in the school is funded through taxes, but the, the playground is, is something that the, the families have to pay for. And one of the, the bigger challenges with that relates to this is the fact that, you know, I, I'm a CPA, I, I'm a dad, I've, I've studied how the, the money comes from the state or the county into the school, but by the time anyone figures all that out, their kids have moved on from elementary school and then they're into middle school and there's another group of people taking over. Now we're building the infrastructure in our local PTA to, to have the documentation in place and, and you know, all the connections that need to be made amongst each other to know how things work, um, but it's, it's a big effort. Um, <clears throat> I would say that some of the key takeaways here are playgrounds are getting more expensive. Um, thankfully, the, the Nathan Baker Chris Foundation has actually helped us with our playground that is designated speci specifically for uh, the differently abled children. But they're, they're, they're more inclusive these days, which is a good thing, and they're also safer these days. Uh, if you know anything about playgrounds, like swings, like you, they, you, we're not even contemplating that um, because it's just, you know, things are very expensive. Everything's more expensive. Playgrounds even more so. Uh, but there's also a lot more eyes on this right now. The, the, the parents are showing up. We had at our most recent fundraiser, I mean, that place was packed. I'm surprised the fire marshal didn't come in and shut us down. We had so many people. Um, so I would ask you to consider, and I understand, if it takes time, you know, whatever it takes, and I'm happy to help with the legwork, but get us, get us over the finish line, please. We can do this, we've got lots of momentum, but there's only so much the working families in our, in our neighborhood can handle. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here, and thank you for your enthusiasm. And um, do we have any questions from our group? Uh, I do. Um, Mr. Rusty. He is, Delegate Stanko has a question. I do have oh, a question. Oh. Oh, and Delegate oh, okay. Stanko also Delegate does have a question. It, it's really for anyone, and I'll, I'll ask the same of the, <coughs> for the Westminster Elementary School. Is there, has the new Board of Ed, uh, can you just give, give a lens on where they stand with this, and has there been a formal framework around that? Um, at this time, we are talking with Steve Whistler. Um, he lives in the Carrolltown area, so he knows his son went to Carrolltown, um, his stepson, um, who is now in seventh grade. Um, he's working, but I know that it's not in their normal school improvement plan sure. budget. That's right. not normally a line item there. Should be or not. Yep. I'm from Westminster Elementary, and I've been told that there's not even enough money in their budget to cover the HVAC, so there's no way that they could any time in the next several years um, find playgrounds. It's not anything that's in their budget. Yeah, but I, I, for me, it was less about the in the context of this, the budget, than where they stand as a group in, in terms of the, the playground itself and replacement. The last time um, uh, our president, Nikki, actually went and spoke with the Board of Education uh, when the playground first came out, and uh, it, politics of this really don't matter because it went across the board. Um, their response was that we should just save our money and plan for it. And they said that really the, they really can't do a good job at building playgrounds because things take so long and maybe if they did it, it wouldn't be as good. So that, that, that was the last we heard, which... I'll just say thank you for your hard work. Uh, we really appreciate it. Commissioner Rothstein. I just want to... Uh, Commissioner Ed Rothstein, okay. Um, or I guess Mr. Ed Rothstein, for that matter, being here just uh, in full support of what's happening down in Carrolltown. I was at the... Uh, event the other day and like it was said uh, it was packed and I never seen a community come so together as I saw the parents with the kids spending a whole lot of, of money in in this the silent auction um, all of the events that were happening the Board of Education CCPS is fully supportive of these playgrounds the challenge is that the funding isn't there from the Board of Education um, 
the best solution, and I've said it before, nobody knows Carroll County better than Carroll Countyans, and it's a community effort. So whatever we can do holistically from the community to get us as far as we can, you know, Nathan uh, Baker Foundation is phenomenal in taking care of our kids. Uh, we're going to continue to do it, but sa same request. Whatever you can do to support these type of uh, projects, it's going to go a long way for our community. So thank you. Thank you. Any questions for Commissioner Ralstein? Okay. Thank you very much. I did for the two others in the PTA. Do you have questions? Yeah. Um, Delegate Tomlinson has a question for um, the PTA folks. I know you said that if you, if you guys were able to get the money, it could be completed by next school year? Yeah, that's the plan. As soon as we have the money um, in place, the, we would put in the formal order for the equipment that's already been designed. It's already, we're just waiting for the funding before we can get money. Okay, e even like in today's climate, I just, I know with a lot of construction related, I mean, I understand a playground's different than, you know, building a warehouse, but, uh, I mean, I know a lot of construction. I mean, there's del heavy delays, but the, you guys are being told that they could get this done pretty quickly. I, I was told that. I haven't actually spoken to, I'm on the playground committee as the parent representative. Um, I haven't actually spoken to the designer of the playground, but it is my understanding that they are ready to go as soon as we can pay them. Uh, color in that regard. So <clears throat> uh, there's a couple things we can do in terms of timing to get this done as quickly as possible. One strategy is to just take the money that we have and just get started on it. And um, other schools in our area have done the same thing where they, they take what they have and, and they at least get off the ground and, and get running on it. Um, some other things that we're looking at though, um, in terms of, you know, because we, we don't control construction timelines. And in my experience with anything, like nothing ever gets done uh, faster than you think. Um, but we can certainly get the process started the, the sooner, you know, we, we at least know we're going to have enough funds to complete the project. Okay. Have, have for you guys who have been around, you know, Sender West, um, Sender Edie, Delia Rose, have we have we submitted before requests like this for playground equipment and had any success with it? We have um, gotten playgrounds previously for, I believe we were up to three schools now. Hampstead. Uh, ha we, we have Hampstead, Westminster Hampstead. Elementary, Freedom Elementary. And I, I think that's all. And in Baltimore County, I've gotten yeah. money for playgrounds and um, this past year for a track and for tennis courts at a local high school. So it's unfortunate you would think that this, these sort of athletic facilities would be paid for by the school board, but it's not the case in Baltimore County. It's not the case in Carroll County. So we have to be resourceful. What tends to happen is, uh, you know, do we want the taxpayer funds to be used for new HVAC systems and roofs or do we want the playgrounds? And I hate that that sounds like I'm not trying to be cold and heartless. That's what it's been said to me in a nice way, not in a bad way. And, it, and you understand that point of view. And we need to hear from the other folks on, on, our, on our list, but um, we, we need to continue this conversation. I think it's fair to say we all need to continue this conversation. We're trying to be helpful. We didn't even know until about three years ago that, that this was like a thing and that we could help with it. So we've tried, but we also try to be fair. We don't want to favor anybody over another. So, and we only get so much allocated. So that's kind of our situation, but we definitely want to keep the conversation going. So Absolutely. let me address timing for a second. So the General Assembly ends in early April. By that time, you will know how much m bond money has been allocated to the various projects, including yours. The money typically is not available till July 1st, when the new fiscal year starts. Okay. But then it is available from that point on. All right. Great point. Thank you for that information. Great. Thank you very much. Okay. We are now ready to hear from Westminster Elementary School. Good afternoon. My name is Stacy Tracy, and I'm a certified public accountant and treasurer of the Westminster Elementary School PTO. I have two children who attend Westminster Elementary School, and I'm also the assistant controller of McDaniel College. I'm here to speak on behalf of the Westminster Elementary School PTO and all of the staff and children at the school to request partial funding for a new ADA compliant playground. Unfortunately, more than half of the school's playground was removed by the county because it was deemed hazardous. 
For the past two years, we've done everything we can think of to try to raise funds to replace this playground, which was torn down by the county. We've raised approximately $82,000 through PTO-sponsored fun runs, readathons, restaurant nights, bingos, GoFundMe campaigns, paint nights, grants, and sponsorship requests from local businesses. Of the $82,000 that we've raised, $50,000 was a capital grant that the state awarded us last year, which we are very grateful for. Throughout our research, we have discovered that Carroll County Public Schools have successfully raised funds for some playgrounds by parents, like Freedom Elementary, which is a higher income area. A lot of students that attend Westminster Elementary School live in a lower income area, which is comprised mostly of apartments and townhouses. These parents want to help as much as they can, but they don't have excess in to income to contribute, especially with inflation. The demographics for our school show that 44.6% of students have free or reduced lunches and breakfasts. For most of our, before most of our playground was torn down by the county, the playground was used daily by students at the school, ABC Care, which is the before and after school program, and the community. Play is an essential part of childhood and development. This playground will help support our students' physical health and increase their chance of succeeding in the classroom and in life. Our goal is to install a new ADA-compliant playground that's suitable for all abilities and ages. The cost of the equipment, construction, and landscaping is $160,000. We know this is a large endeavor, but we're confident with your sponsorship, we can make this happen. Since we've already raised $82,000, we're asking that you sponsor the remaining $78,000. We've met with a contractor that is used frequently by Carroll County Public Schools, and they're prepared to install the playground if it's fully funded in 2023. In fact, right now with the amount of money that we've already raised, we can buy the equipment now at today's prices. And they'll store it for us for free until we're ready to start, which is something that we're looking into right now. According to the state of Maryland's website, the state awarded many schools last year the entire amount for their playgrounds through these legislative bonds. Here's just a few for your reference. Warren Elementary School in Baltimore County was awarded $150,000. Cromwell Elementary School, $150,000. Montgomery County Public Schools, $1,350,000. Greenbelt Playground, $150,000. Upper Marble County, $275,000. Baltimore County Smart Playground, $300,000. Prince George's County State of Art Playground, $200,000. And those are just a few. Time is of the essence to raise these funds for our students. Because right now, they hardly have anything to play on. We ask that you sponsor our school for a $78,000 bond so that we can fully fund our playground. Without your help, I don't believe we're going to be able to fund this for several more years because of the demographics of our students and our parents. Unfortunately, we don't live in such a wealthy area as Carrolltown. I wish that was the case. Um, below is a photo in my testimony of the remaining playground for your reference. The whole entire, it's on the second page. Um, it's a small photo, so I wanted you to take a look at it. Um, you can see how little left the children can have to play on. Thank you for taking time to listen to our request today, and please let me know if you have any questions, and I have my email on the second page of the testimony as well. Thank you very much for being here today. Um, do we have any questions for? Why, why did the county uh, tear it down, did you say? You know, they came out one day and inspected it, and just without no notice told us that it was deemed hazardous and we had no time to prepare for this. So for the last a couple of years they've had, if you look at the picture, hardly nothing to play on. And you know, we've really done everything that we can possibly think of and we still are. We've applied for over 50 grants. Um, we've sent over 100 letters to local businesses asking for money. 
Um, we have different sponsorship levels where they can donate to get put on our playground si sign or a website. And, um, you know, we have a team of 10 parents that are just doing everything they can. But, um, y you know, I just, uh, you know, after looking at how much we funded, you, you know, our fun run brought in roughly $30,000. And, um, I think it probably would, t looking at our budget, it would take a couple more years to fund it. We really skim back to the bare bones on anything else supporting the kids in our school, which is also a little sad because it's taking away from the things that, you know, software that we used to support for the students as well as assemblies and, you know, any other projects. We've just, you know, the principal and us have just cut everything down to bare bones. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. And I believe Winfield Fire to, Volunteer Fire Company is here. Did anyone come from Winfield today? That's a no. Okay. Okay. Um, so before we move on to the next section, I just wanted to take a brief moment to recognize some of our folks that are here. Um, we had. Uh, Commissioner Rothstein is here today. Do you want to? You already spoke. Uh, we have Commissioner Gordon here today. Commissioner Kenny Kyler. Commissioner Vigliotti. I think that's all of our commissioners here today. And then, who do we have? And we have Tara Battaglia here today as well from our school board. So thank you all for being here today. I'm going to throw in, we have, um, you already heard, of course, from the mayor of Mount Airy with his tour through Mount Airy, and you, <laughs> we also, but we do have, I see Mayor Perry Jones from Union Bridge, and Mayor Ru Neil Roop from New Windsor. I don't know if I missed, and oh, stay, Mayor Link, I'm sorry, you're right there. I'm looking right at you, Mayor Link from Sykesville. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and then finally, uh, we have our state's attorney here, Haven Shoemaker. So um, just to let everybody know and those watching that we've got a lot of our local elected officials here and we look forward to partnering with them on these things and many other items as we, uh, as we move forward, so. Yes, thank you. Okay, next on our agenda would be a request um, from the Carroll County Board of Elections and I believe I saw Katie Gary here. That's great, thank you. Katie does a really good job, and it's been a big challenge over the last uh, couple of years with all of the map changes. So we appreciate the work that you do. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me today. Um, again, Catherine Berry, I'm the election director with the Carroll County Board of Elections. I'm here today to speak on behalf of my five-member board. Um, every 10 years, we undertake redistricting, and redistricting has three levels, congressional, legislative, and commissioner districts. So in Carroll County, because we have commissioner districts, um, when the lines are redrawn on the county level, they are submitted to the General Assembly in the form of a bill. And of course, that was done last year. Um, when we were able to overlay all of the maps in time for the delayed primary election, um, an overlay means congressional, legislative, and commissioner districts all go combined together. That forms our election district precinct map that you see. Um, so what I have before you is a request because when we undertook redistricting, um, we went from 36 precincts in Carroll County to 52. And we have now undertaken a term called um, micro precincts and ghost precincts. So those that are less than 150 registered voters, and we have two precincts that actually have zero voters. So um, what this request does is clean up some of the micro precincts. And the main concern that the board has is concerning voter privacy, because there are some locations that may only have four registered voters in them. So if those folks go and vote in different ways, by mail, at early voting, and on election day, there is a potential um, that someone could put in a PIA request to find out how certain individuals have voted because it is so small and micro. 
So what I've provided on the second page, you'll see a um, census population. That is what the census drew in. That is not necessarily the number of actual registered voters. Um, the number of registered voters is less, and then the number of people that actually voted is even smaller. So um, in our case, in two of these precincts, we had five voters vote in one of them and seven voters vote in another one. Um, there are some other just um, ancillary effects to having these micro precincts that involve space um, in my warehouse and my um, my office that we um, are limited on. It creates a very hard um, situation with determining where polling places are located because there are certain laws that restrict us from going over more than one precinct line. So um, this bill would essentially um, clean up some of the map and it would reduce um, you know, just some of that voter privacy issue that we are having and experiencing now. Um, this is different than the congressional and the legislative because it goes through um, the, the commissioners and through the delegation to get that to be a specific bill to um, the county. So that's all I have for today. Thank you. Thanks for coming in. Mm -hmm. um, this is, uh, it's very complicated. Uh, so is, with, if we move these precincts, mm -hmm. this, this only affects the county commissioners. That's correct. So, for example, uh, you want to, you're suggesting that um, precinct 11-2 be moved from one current commissioner district to another. Mm -hmm. if, if we did that, would that change the population or the lines of any con uh, congressional district or legislative district? Or is it only going to change the commissioner district lines? Um, so I only did for the commissioner district. I, I believe um, most everything is within um, the legislative district five and then the same congressional um, district as okay. well. It doesn't matter quite so much for the legislative districts, but for the congressional, congressional. districts, for whatever reason, <laughs> each one is supposed to have exactly the same population. Mm -hmm. And that you might, we might run into problems in Annapolis if one of these switches changed the population of congressional districts. Sure, so I can uh, double check. Go back and double check on that. But I know many of them are all in the same, same okay. district. Thanks. Yeah. If I may, Senator West, are you sure it needs to be exactly the same? I thought there was supposed to be a, that it that has to be for congressional okay. exactly. For the, for the legislative, we have wiggle room, but for the congressional, literally, they're supposed to be exactly the same. Well, that's a very good point you just made. Thank you. So uh, can I ask you two questions? One is that we probably should be sure it doesn't change anybody in a state legislative district either, and not because I care about it changing our districts, but because I think that could also run into a problem in Annapolis where they would say, well, we can't start changing anything about state legislative districts. Um, uh, but the second thing was you talk about the privacy. A, a couple of these precincts, obviously, there's almost no people in them, but the ones that are more people, and I know people's not voters. You made that point very well. How I, I'm, I'm struggling to understand, how would somebody file a FOIA or a Freedom of Information Act request and find out the identity of a person? Or if it's just two people voted, let's say, can you explain that one more time just so it's clear? Sure. I mean, I guess anything's possible um, for, for them to do that. We've never had that case happen before, but um, we have had voters contact us out of concern because now there are essentially three ways of voting at early voting by mail and election day. So if only one person voted, um, say, vote by mail, um, because now Maryland has ballot styles by precinct, so that precinct um, when you see the election results for vote by mail, if you only have one person vote in that precinct, you can essentially identify, um, you know, potentially who that voter because was. Because there was one mail-in ballot in that precinct and mm -hmm. one and vote for so-and-so. Yes. And, that, okay. and candidates can request information for, you know, who requested mail-in ballots right. and that type of thing. So it is definitely possible. Um, nobody's ever admitted to doing it, but... <laughs> No. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. So you'll get back to us with, okay, that's wonderful. Thank I'll you. I'll make a quick comment. We'll, we will be checking to be sure we can actually, if we wanted to do this, we need to be sure we actually can do it. So Yes, I, I did get an uh, official attorney general's yeah, opinion, okay. and it is, uh, I, 
it is possible. possible. Because it only impacts the county, you. right. That's okay. correct. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we are now going to move on to the Carroll County Professional Firefighters and Paramedics. We have somebody here. Everybody yes. got their nice little packet we got everybody going here. So my name is Michael Karolanko. I'm president of the Carroll County Professional Firefighters and Paramedics Association. Um, uh, this has been an evolving uh, issue over the last couple of days. Uh, we had a conversation down in Annapolis um, that kind of necessitated us moving forward to um, work on enabling legislation uh, with our relationship with the county. So uh, I have a few remarks here and then we can, of course, I can answer your questions moving forward with that. The Carroll County Professional Firefighters and Paramedics Association is asking to introduce an enabling legislation that would allow the Board of County Commissioners to establish a meet and confer relationship with our organization and recognize us as an exclusive representative of the employees of the Carroll County Department of Fire and EMS. As our organization has been the, our, our, our organization has been the career representative of the current full-time fire and EMS employees of Carroll County that are currently working for the fire companies. We sit as a representative and member of the Emergency Services Advisory Council for the county. As established by the ESAC bylaws and Board of the County Commissioners, we have functionally participated in the development of the Department of Fire and EMS to include the strategic planning process this last year, and have an ongoing dialogue with the Board of County Commissioners and the Department of Fire and EMS Chief Robinson. With the transition of the Department of Fire and EMS, we will soon have county employees who are represented by our, our organization. There will be as many as 150 employees at the beginning of FY24 and 240 in FY25. To keep our relationship within legality, we are asking that, that this enabling legislation is put forward to allow for meet and confer between our organization and the county officially. We have always ensured a respect for the value and recognition of our volunteer counterparts and the authority of the Department of Fire and EMS and the county government. Our organization firmly believes that the best route for the future health of the Carroll County Department of Fire and EMS is a collaborative, inclusive, equitable culture that values all stakeholders in the system and includes the citizen, volunteer, career, and governmental partners. We want to maintain our seat at the table to continue offering our perspective and advocating for the health, safety, and working conditions of our members. This bill, bill would enable commissioners to continue that relationship and our participation above board certainly not for not to force anyone's hand I want to be clear that this bill does expressly does not do does not allow for any level of collective bargaining or binding arbitration it does not remove the final say from the board of county commissioners or chief robinson the department of fire and ems and it does not force any employees uh to join this organization uh and it is it is and always will remain a voluntary membership um i have that you know we we put together a uh proposed uh, initial language uh, for the bill. We, uh, Charles County recently, had, it, I think it was 2017, had a bill that went through uh, with the organization down there, the representative down there. Um, that was for collective bargaining. We are not looking for anything of that sort. We're looking for the meet and confer uh, and the recognition. So uh, we kind of took the meat and potatoes out of that, that document to try to put it here. Unfortunately, I don't have the, the legal expertise of Mr. West or anyone else of so just a lowly criminal justice major with a short interaction with all of that. So uh, we've done our best here and we will look forward with this process moving forward. Also want to say that um, we wanted to make sure we came here with the public hearing to make this, this uh, presentation with you all. Um, very important to us is that we would get the support of the commissioners moving forward uh, in this process and I know that they're working through that, although I do not want to speak for them at all uh, in their, their, I guess, process working this out for themselves. If I may, Mr. Sure. Karlanko, I think I appreciate you and all your membership for all the hard work you put into helping us with the EMS transition here in Carroll County. Yes, sir. I appreciate all the information you supplied when I got to my desk this morning. This is the first thing I read. And I like the fact that you referenced Charles County because demographically and population is the most parallel to Carroll County. So thank you for all the work you put into this and we'll put deep consideration in this for you. Thank you. Yes, sir. I appreciate that. Do we have any other comments or questions? Yeah, let me just uh, say, I, I find this whole thing confusing. Are you telling us that, um, that, it's, that unless the Maryland General Assembly enacts a bill, you don't have the right to voluntarily meet with the uh, county commissioners and chat with them? 
Well, certainly not. I think that there's an important dialogue that is this, exists with the county commissioners. Um, I, I think there's a functional relationship that moves forward as we move from, you know, solely the advocacy group of between us and the county commissioners through this whole process uh, to becoming county employees. Um, we're, we're a subsidiary of the International Association of Firefighters, and through that, we have a whole host of, host of resources that we're able to bring to the table. That includes grant writing, it includes um, member services, uh, different avenues for you know, searching out funding, all of those kind of things. Um, I think what we wanna do is we wanna make sure that there is a, 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 you know, the legality and the, the specificity and the I guess a structure to that relationship as we move forward. I think the, the two pieces we have in here, obviously it's enabling legislation, so we're, you know, this would put the conversation back to the commissioners to, and you know, dialogue to figure out how this is implemented, but um, you know, ultimately I, I'm a fan of, of structure and expectations, and I think you know, ultimately creating an MOU of some sort that lays out the meet and confer relationship allows the future of that relationship to move forward on a consistent basis. So we're not looking at any scenario where maybe conversations go sideways and they start appealing to some kind of issue that isn't pertaining to this meet and confer relationship. And I would point towards uh, benefits and pay and things like that. That's not what we're talking about here. Well, is, is, um, the, is the term um, meet and confer some kind of a term of art? Because if I want to talk to Kenny Kyler, I'll call Kenny Kyler. And the two of us yes, will sir. just talk. I don't need yes, to get a piece of legislation passed in Annapolis for me to talk to Kenny Kyler. Why do, why do you, you all need, why do you think you need legislation passed in Annapolis so, well, so you can talk to Kenny Kyler? Well, I would also push that back down to the fact that, you know, uh, I'd, the FOP has a relationship with the sheriff. Um, the sheriff is certainly elected and everything else and has his, his processes with that. Our, our leader in our department is an employee of the, of the department. Um, I think that it's out of respect uh, on our side that we want to make sure that this is structured and that there are the expectations and the parameters that are set to that, uh, that relationship uh, in a structured way to allow for, you know, protection for that individual as well, whoever the chief is of the department and that structure that relationship. I'd also point to, in here we are asking, and I, I'll be clear about it, to be recognized as the exclusive representative of the employees. Um, you know, I, I think that we've done a fair job and certainly an effective one up to this point of bringing the collaborative voice together for the career staffing of uh, Carroll County. You know, it, I think that relationship only continues. Um, well, let, let me, let me the, ask this. Sir. It, are you aware of any other case in which a county uh, has asked the General Assembly for legislation authorizing people like you to talk to the county commissioners? Um, I can, would, would I can certainly look into it. Uh, I know, uh, so obviously this is something that's I'm working through and I'm learning about also as we kind of meet these initial phases of this. Um, I, I can tell you clearly that we were, we were given kind of direction from, from our mentors, the people above us and our, you know, the, the structure of the International Association of Firefighters, that this would be an advantageous step to take to make sure that we're solidifying the relationship with uh, the county and the Department of Fire and EMS to make sure that we're within legality at any given point. Okay, we'll, we'll take a look, would you? Because I, I yes, can sir. anticipate if we filed this bill and sat there to testify in Annapolis before fellow senators uh, and wanting this, I can see them asking the same questions of me that I've just been asking of you. Why do you need a piece of legislation right. so the, these firefighters can talk to the county commissioners? Sir, well, and I think it's different too. It, we have. You know, the, the volunteers have the, the Carroll County Volunteer Emergency Services Association. Baltimore County has, you know, the, likewise with that. Um, I, I think that the difference kind of becomes between them and, and the county, or them and us, is that, you know, the employment standards, is that you have the legality of employment and everything else. And we certainly don't want any kind of uh, issue that, you know, in the process of conversations and working things out that, um, you know, anything would be in jeopardy as far as somebody's employment status or something of that sort. So I, I think there's a lot of structure to be, you know, gained from this, a lot of, you know, uh, security on both sides of the conversation. Um, I promise you that I'm going to go look into those issues. Uh, so we have that. Like I said, this is a, a moving target for us initially as we're moving into it because we're learning about it. Um, I know the, the county commissioners are also working through it on their side. Um, and that dialogue will continue there. And I hope a lot of this is, is hashed out in the coming days while we get that. I, I will full on admit that we understand that this is a tight timetable as far as this conversation is considered. I, but the county employees coming in as early as, the first county employees coming in as early as February or March this year, um, 
I have a concern that if we don't motivatedly work towards a solution or motion in this legislative session here, uh, by the time we're able to start doing that again, we're looking at a year and a half, two years of employment if this is, ne if this is necessitated um, before we have that, that relationship established. I will say uh, wholeheartedly that if we determine in this process that we don't need that, that we're above legality, that we're okay on all this process as far as our relation goes moving forward, I think that that's a firm an and, you know, fine answer just the same. I, I, I want us to see a, have a great relationship just as we've had this whole time. Um, it's benefited the whole process with the Department of Fire and EMS moving forward. Um, it certainly give a, a new perspective to Carroll County uh, in this whole conversation of Fire and EMS uh, delivery. And I want to see that continue. Uh, that, that's certainly where we are. We have a, a seat at the table now, and we don't want to lo lose a seat at the table tomorrow. So I, I appreciate your concerns wholeheartedly, and I'll make sure I follow up. Let me just finish by saying that there is a deadline for us to introduce bills. Yes, sir. It's coming pretty soon. So yes, if you can get that information, get back to us quickly, it would be appreciated. That is my, my whole goal of the next hours. So I promise I'll get you that, sir. Okay. I'll get Tomlinson. Um, yeah, just to kind of piggyback off what Senator West was asking. Um, I mean, meet and confer. I mean, the yeah. definition of this, I mean, so in reality, what does that mean? Does that mean that you as the, as the uh, president of the local organization and, the, and Chief Robinson, I mean, you know, have a have a 12 o'clock meeting time every other Thursday? Or does that mean that you shoot him an email that he's got to respond to you? I mean, I, I don't understand like what yeah. the relationship so you're putting. The functional part of that, and maybe uh, I don't know if it answers some questions for Mr. West as well. It, uh, it, it, the difference is when we start talking about policy and things like this. So we're not dealing with anything that goes back to benefits, pay, anything that's associated with that. We're not negotiating by any means. But where we can then start to give some feedback in is certain is, is policy. So, for instance, operational issues, if there's some kind of administrative, whatever else, we can help. Through, we can work through a, like maybe a review process of some sorts to provide dialogue back to that. We are not by any means dictating or negotiating with the county, but it does give us an ability as the representative for the employee on, you know, understanding the employee's concerns the collective conversation that we have outside of this to be able to bring that perspective back into these conversations, give the feedback on the policies, whether they're being developed or otherwise, and then that way hopefully guide proactively the department as we move forward. I think that if I look outside of maybe having a legal definition of meet and confer in this, my concern becomes that if, if there's any kind of point where me as an employer, even a, a member of this president of this organization, but also a hopeful employee of this department starts receiving policy ahead of everybody else, there could be a, a moment where that the the lack of structure and that exists in that that potential relationship without something like this in place would lead to maybe questions or issues as as that goes forward so I, you know like i said is as we hash this out we'll be able to answer those questions a little bit more in the coming minutes hopefully but um you know i want to make sure that we're staying above board in those moments as well um so, so right now, your organization represents paid mem pay paid employees of the individual fire companies. Yes, sir. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. The with the big all the changes going on. Yes. Those folks who work for the individual fire companies do not have automatic jobs with the county government. They all have to reapply. Correct. So, speaking from the comments made in open session, um, and and everything that we've understood this whole time. Um, we've obviously been concerned about making sure that we're taking care of those individuals that are currently serving the county and in many cases have been doing it for decades. But the county has clearly stated their responsibility and the legal, you know, I guess, well, responsibility not to use the word over again, but the, they have to vet their employees coming in. So there's a hiring process that's been established for everyone that's, being, that's applying to the Department of Fire and EMS, whether it's an outside employee or a current, uh, somebody who's working for one of the fire companies and currently serving the, the citizens of Carroll County uh, through that capacity. Um, in open session, it's been stated multiple times, you, you, you meet that vetting criteria, you meet the, the criteria of the hiring process, uh, you have preference as far as moving forward in that uh, service of Carroll County becoming department, 
part of the Department of Fire and EMS. And um, we would certainly hope, hope that, that the words that have been, you know, like I said, set out in open session before, we continue to stand true. But, you know, it is an, obviously a translation and a process to go from where we are here now with the hiring process actually taking place right now uh, to where we're going to be in a, you know, a few weeks, a few months. And how many members are there of your organization? We have over 60 right now. 60? Mm-hmm. Yes, sir. So if every one of them gets hired, you would still be at 60 and... Well, I, I, I can tell you that commonplace to the, to the fire department, uh, international membership is... A, a pretty consistent piece of that because of all the resources that we bring. We're not just the representative on this level of this kind of thing. Um, we bring mental health uh, and peer support services, even to the point that we have an inpatient mental health uh, treatment facility that's targeted just towards fire and EMS uh, service members for this. Uh, there's a lot of other resources and educational training otherwise that our organization brings to the table for the members. So it's not just the aspect of the of this kind of representation. It's a the international as a whole and the resources. So well, those members, as they come in, typically join into these organizations. Um, you know, according to the Supreme Court, there's no closed shop anymore by any means. And we wouldn't certainly, we, it's never been our policy even before they made a decision like that to create a closed shop scenario. Um, every one of our members is a voluntary member who pays dues and comes and wants to be part of our organization and, and the conversation that we hold. Um, we want to see that move forward. You know, being at the number that we're here right now, we don't have 150 employee, full-time employees out there serving the county right now at all. That number is going to expand as we move forward, and it starts filling in positions that were previously covered in other some capacity, where a lot of guys were working for multiple companies at a time. So that number is going to change and evolve as we move on, and so too will our membership, uh, the, the number of our members and everything else is that, that expands. We will have more members in a, you know, continuing significant proportion of that membership as you know this thing unfolds. So I, 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 as Elegant Thompson, I understand there's a lot of future tense in this, and this is certainly the whole enabling legislation idea is a conversation of future tense. We're enabling the future conversation process of, of handling and, and knocking all this this out, the details out as we move forward to a, a, a potential decision, you know, in the future of the commissioners to enact, you know, a, uh, a local ordinance to allow for this relationship to take place. So, you know, learning and moving right now, but we're going to continue to do that moving forward uh, and developing that with the commissioners as we move as well. Senator Reedy. Yeah, yes, Mike, uh, just in, I, real quick, so the difference between CC Visa mm -hmm. and you yes. right now in how you interact with the commissioners is what? So uh, specifically, CC Visa is listed multiple times and cited multiple times as a representative of the volunteers in different documents that are you know exist, whether it's the ESAC or otherwise. Are they um, in state law though? I, uh, but this They're doesn't list us in state law either. So I would I would say that is that all this enabling legislation in state law says is that it gives the county the ability to rep to recognize a. Um, a group, a, an a organization. Group. Okay. So, but it does not list us solely right. as okay. that group. So just as the same as CCV is looking at enabling legislation, I can't remember the verbiage particularly off the top of my head that exists as far as naming CC visa or otherwise in that whole um, organization that, or that, that legislation. Um, I, I can't no, remember I was just curious. No, that, that yeah, so, but, yeah, yeah. but just the same, we would, we would not be looking for to be named in the state legislation. That process would then be pushed back to the commissioners right. for their decision and you know, how they want to move forward on that. Uh, and then we're going to, the commissioners, so just for just for my commentary, and I know we've talked about this, but yes, just for, for public record, I mean, I, you know, I think we're wanting to hear from them as, as to what, at least I am. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so we're wanting to hear from, from them and what their thoughts are, and I think they're going to, it sounds like you, there's going to be that dialogue over the in the coming days. So well, I, I certainly hope so. I know I've, I've, I've spoken to all the commissioners at this point, and uh, I've, I've passed off. All of the, I sent it to many of everybody that I could find their email for in a short amount of time in the mess, but um, making sure everybody has the same information moving yeah. forward. With so they'll dialogue. go through their process. All right, well, no, I appreciate yes, that. Yeah, I just was trying to understand the, the distinction. So that's great. Thank you very much. Yes, sir, I appreciate it. I get Thank one, you. One more thing. Oh, Senator yeah. West. Yeah, yeah. Oh, um, sir, I yeah, no, no, it's really enough for you. It's, um, I would feel more, I would feel more comfortable if the one of the, the attorneys for the commissioners were to meet with us and tell us that in the attorney's view under existing law, 
it's not possible for you to meet and talk with them unless we pass this legislation. Oh, well, certainly. Okay, thanks. Yeah, and, and not not to be argumented by any means because it's not my intention. Just to clarify, the other piece of that would be the the recognition piece is, is another concern in there for us, which is incorporated in, into the enable legislation is allowing them to do that. So that's that's the other side of that, and I think it. Maybe that comes to part of our conversation, the intent of what we what we move forward with. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, uh, Delegate Thompson had one more follow up. Uh, uh, well, actually, uh, no. Off of what Senator West just asked, sure. be, behind you, M M Mr. Burke, I, I see you back there. Do you do you do you don't? Okay, okay. I just didn't know if okay. Don't worry, don't worry through. about it. You, you're off the clock. We're working through. Yeah, we, <laughs> we trust that you will all be working together and will get, get back to us with follow up information. We, we don't decide to put anybody on the spot. Yeah, that's We great. appreciate that. Well, I was actually soliciting a good one liner joke from Burke. You got any? I think he'll No, I think we'll pass on that. Okay. Um, we're going to move on to new business, um, but it was brought to my attention. We had two other elected officials here. I just wanted to recognize Sykesville Councilman Mark Dyer and New Windsor Councilman Dave Hoffman here as well. So thank you for being here today. Um, so we're going to move on to the last item um, is new business. So if you, um, how should we do this? Um, I, I'll call names if you've signed up to speak. If you're here, um, you can come forward. So we'll start off with uh, Gary McGinnis. Yes, good afternoon. I don't have any specific issues. I just have one question. Would it be possible for the delegation to have one email address that you could share so we don't have to type in six names, whatever? Um, we, we don't have an official government email address for that. We, we have put down to... Oh, yeah. Why don't you take the emails and use Florida? That, yeah, generally what uh, yeah, cuz it's generally what we've done is we've had you email usually the house and senate chair but so it's April and I right now and we but we disperse everything. Either one of us you could email and we will we will be sure. That's actually a great Gary makes a great point. So if you're watching the thousands the millions watching right now and also <laughs> or later potentially millions of people could be watching this potentially. Uh, <laughs> yeah, sure. No, actually if you're in the room or if you you see this later or watching now if you email uh, Delegate Rose or myself, and it's something for the delegation, we'll be sure our, to distribute that to all six so that, you know, in fact, we want that. Anything you've seen today or heard today, we want to give a comment on. We're, we're not voting up today, obviously. We're going to be meeting to vote in, in the future. Uh, so we, we definitely want any input that anybody has and any thoughts anybody has. One last thing, if I may. Uh, part of me is looking for the party, but has he rescheduled the uh, delegation? <laughs> uh, news TBD. We're we're working on it. We're working on it. We have some logistical issues in yes. Annapolis right now. They've completely demolished the Department of Legislative Services building, and most of our meeting spaces are now. So we have to be off site. We have to be off site so for that. Yeah. It, it's a bit of a challenge, but we'll work on that. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for being here today. Uh, we have next Jack Hayden here. So I'm, I'm here today kind of in an informative way. Uh, thank you for this forum. Um, it's good to know what you guys do for us, and, and I guess we're all here begging for money. <laughs> That's what it looks like. But anyway, <laughs> um, so there's several, there, there's two that I know I'm aware of, uh, solar, uh, pro commercial solar projects uh, going on in, in the county right now. It's going through the, uh, I guess you'd call it the approval process uh, of meeting all the criteria. The commissioners uh, a few years back uh, changed the zoning law to allow <coughs> uh, solar fields in, on small agricultural pieces of ground that, uh, and I think it was done because the state's leaning on the county to have more solar and and it'll help the farmer out who only gets $100 an acre or whatever he gets, and he only has 50 acres, so he can't make a living. But the, all those issues aside, there's a heated debate going on by the communities, and I'm one of them that I have to look out my front door and see it. 
that I'm vehemently opposed to it, uh, and I think it's totally inappropriate that you put a nonconforming use on an agricultural piece of ground by right. I think, I think it's a misuse of the zoning law. Um, but as we fight through this, and there's two more proposed, I believe, I heard about, uh, under the same guidelines, wanted to make you aware of it so that you can be, uh, you know people. I, it may not be your area or your responsibilities, but you know people and we, we need a voice sometimes. So we say, hey, you know, who do we talk to at the county about this or that or the other? And, and, and it's, it's good if you'll be at least available for us and aware of it. Uh, that's that's uh, one of the main reasons I'm here today. And, um, and, and, I, and of course, there's so many things I could say. It's inappropriate that the state has to lean on the county for some solar project when they're building massive warehouses everywhere and it should be a building code uh, perhaps uh, requirement that if you're building a 200,000 you know, square foot warehouse that you, you get to put solar on your roof. Um, I'm an advocate of solar. I just bought an electric car, oh my God. Um, and uh, uh, we're looking at putting solar on our roof, you know. Uh, and it's very strange. Uh, I've been involved in a commercial solar project, and they limit you to only amount of juice that you use. It's like they don't want you to be in the business for profit. And I understand that these solar farms are wildly profitable, mm. which I was unaware of, but apparently they're very lucrative. And um, so we need help to rein, rein in at least all these regulations that are go they're going through right now, I think, are trying to hide them so that nobody has to see them. <laughs> That's one of the issues. So anyway, you're aware of it, and we may come to you for advice. Thank you for bringing that, um, that to us today. Um, Several years ago when I was first in office, I actually did work with um, our Board of Commissioners at that time to try to make sure that, uh, you know, a solar farm is not agriculture. And, you know, that's obviously what's most important to our community. Um, and there's certainly a place for it, you know, as you mentioned. Um, and I think that's a great ongoing discussion maybe to have with, you know, we have a new Board of Commissioners and with the zoning, that's just my, my little aside. I passed some legislation about that, but then I think the Attorney General struck it down or something like that, so. God love him. Um, okay, um, next we have on our list, uh, Mayor, Mayor Roop is here from New Windsor. Good afternoon, Neil Roop, Mayor of New Windsor. Uh, thank you, delegation, for being here today. Um, for many years, uh, the towns wanted to get together with the delegation and you guys have opened that up for the last couple of years so we greatly appreciate this opportunity uh, you should have four sheets there from the town of new windsor uh, has our water and sewer projects on we appreciate your help in the past and we look forward to uh, soliciting your help again on our water projects on the first page we have three water projects about a $10 million project to replace a 116-year-old water line. Um, every municipality has aging infrastructure, and we're no exception. This was put in, in about, uh, uh, like I say, 116 years ago, and it's almost about a three-mile uh, water line. It feeds uh, our, the most of our water resource. And we're afraid that in the next few years, we're going to see some major, we already had in the past year and a half, a major uh, water break on that line. And we just see that probably continuing, unfortunately. Uh, the water system evaluation, uh, around seventy-five dollars to $100,000. That's just to take a look at all of our options. Also with the Lehigh uh, Quarry, New Windsor uh, Quarry that Lehigh has. And then it, uh, uh, with uh, that's number three there. Um, but the evaluation is to the, take a look at our, our systems. Second page, sewer projects, is uh, a pump station upgrade of a uh, uh, little, little under $500,000. And then uh, another pump station upgrade in Atlee Ridge, that's uh, about three hundred and fifty dollars to $400,000. 
and the wastewater treatment plant that you were very helpful with getting funding last year. Uh, we still will have a shortfall of that and the amounts are all down there listed below. Um, and then number four, the sewer lining. Um, if you're not familiar with uh, uh, I and I, that's infiltration and inflow, which every municipality is uh, dealing with. And this would uh, basically uh, help line our sewer lines instead of having to tear up the roads and replace the pipes. Uh, we've done this uh, on High Street and Main Street to prepare for our streetscape project. And as you can see, the project's there, uh, all totals. And then the, the, then the last page uh, is an update with uh, State Highway Administration. I've talked to a few of you about this. Originally, it was going to be a $10 million project, uh, which uh, included a roundabout and uh, replacement of Springdale, realignment of Springdale Avenue. And then the State Highway Administration said that's too much money for this project. So we cut out the roundabout, we cut out the realignment and a couple other things and got it down to about uh, $7 million. And they were okay with that. And then they come back and say, well, now that's too much money. All we're gonna do is repave the um, road and replace the sidewalks, which is nice, don't get me wrong. However, it's a safety enhancement project and the most dangerous areas of the streets are not gonna be taken care of. A lot of people have to walk literally in a highway to mow their bank on the yards. So we want to eliminate that with a retaining wall. And as you see, there's a shortfall there. Just to give you a little more update, this past town council meeting, we approved um, a, basically a $4 million project to replace the aging water line on High Street and uh, High Street and Main Street. So that's our portion of the responsibilities for streetscape. Once that's done, hopefully in a year and a half, then State Highway Administration will come in and do their share. So we're on a time frame. Um, you know, I've been working with uh, Secretary Brinkley um, and then also Secretary of Transportation uh, to try to get us additional funding. And in the scheme of projects throughout the state, another two and a half, three million dollars to to get to the total amount that's needed for the for their responsibility, um, you know, I think that's a, a easy fix, but that's everybody, everybody wants money. So I understand that and everybody has street projects. Can I have a question? Yes. Real quick, I, I, what, you got the, the, the funding we were able to, to secure with Governor Hogan for the WWTP upgrade. There was another sum of money also for $4 million dollars for the water line replacement. For the water line. So that's in that's reflected in this this Yes. Okay. Well we took we took that project out. It's uh, not on here because you got it. It's not paid on there for. because it's funded. All right. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Oh. Oh, Mayor Root? Yes. I'm glad you're back in the seat as mayor again. Appreciate Some it. Some days, most days, yes. <laughs> Thank you. That, I have to say that we have another former mayor here. Haven Shoemaker and I think he has empathy for what you all go through in these small towns it is a tough job to fill you don't have a whole lot of resources you don't have the the large population but yet you still have all the same necessities of water and sewer and I feel for you and we'll do what we can to try to help you out thank you thank you and I'll speak you know, a little bit for all of our mayors here you know we do what we can with the limited resources and anytime we can get assistance from you guys uh, from the state of Maryland is very helpful uh, to keep lower water and sewer rates and that's that's huge with with every municipality so thank you for your assistance and I know Mayor Jones town is even smaller than yours you guys got your challenges as well okay thank you very much um, next on our list we have mr. Bruce Holstein Thanks for holding this hearing. Uh, I know you're busy. I'm going to be very brief. There are four bills that have been introduced uh, that deal with solid waste, and they are the Reclaim Renewable Energy Act, and there's two bills on composting and one on the Waste Authority Evaluation Act. The Renewable Energy Act will remove subsidies from incineration. 
There are only two trash incinerators operating in Maryland, one in Montgomery County and one in Baltimore City. Montgomery County has indicated it wants to close their incinerator. The contract with Baltimore City expires in 2026, and the subsidies that are being paid for trash in incineration can be reprogrammed and spent on more efficient methods of solid waste disposal. In addition, this act would eliminate subsidies from Maryland's RPS uh, being paid to the Lorton incinerator in amounting to $15 million over about a 12-year period. The composting bills have passed will allow farmers to compost more scraps and food scraps and help schools set up composting programs that will address significant portions of solid waste. Roughly 30% of all the tra trash volume is solid, of solid waste is food materials that can be composted. And almost 70% of all solid waste can be reused in some fashion. The last bill, the Waste Authority Evaluation Act, will have the Department of Legislative Services to evaluate the Northeast Maryland Waste Disposal Authority to see if it can be merged with other state agencies performing similar duties. Carroll County pays a membership fee of about $174,000 to the Waste Authority. Other state agencies can provide the same services at little or no charge to the county. Some of you will see these bills in your committee, and all of you will see them on the floor if they're voted on. I ask for you to support the above mentioned bills, and I provided written documentation over here that they can give you the, I've got highlights in my uh, testimony. You don't have to click on them. I'll print them out for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you very much for being here today. Um, I had Mayor Link next, but I believe she had to step out. Okay. Uh, Yvonne Zeminski. Good afternoon. Let me see. Good afternoon. Thank you for holding this forum. The newspaper said for us to bring your ideas or concerns, so I do bring a concern. Um, my name is Yvonne Zeminski, as stated. I live at 732 David Avenue in Westminster, known as the Fairfield community. And my, I have a serious concern, as do many of my neighbors, with regard to the number of sober living recovery centers that have been allowed to be established in our home development. We have a total of five group homes in our 100 home community. There is one adult with disabilities homed, home and it's owned by the Target Community and Educational Services Incorporated. And we have four sober living recovery centers and of the sober living recovery centers, two are on my street, one is just two doors down, and there are two on Franklin Avenue, two streets over. My concern focuses on the four sober living recovery centers that are not owner occupied. They are subleased. There are three operated by Mulligan Recovery Center of Westminster, they're right on Main Street, and the properties are owned by a property management firm based out of Pennsylvania called B Elite, just the letter B, B Elite Properties, LLC. And the other is the Maddie House, operating out of a property owned by Bayview Mobile Home Park, LLC. So how did this happen to our beautiful community? Sorry, I get a little nervous. Um, I am asking for the 2023 legislation session to seriously look at the Maryland law that has allowed this to happen. Address the density and saturation of sober homes for those of us who live in older communities with no HOA protection and pass new legislation that will protect us and others in Carroll County. And thank you for your time. Thank you for being mm -hmm. here. You did a very nice job. Do you have any questions? I have a question. Senator Reedy. I just wanted to more of a comment, but I know we've spoken and uh, we've, some of us have been working on, on this issue already. Um, uh, I, I, I think it. the community has been really great as they've reached out because they're not against sober living homes, but 
at all, and they understand they need to go. We need them, and they need to be somewhere. Correct. But I think the frustration is the density of four yes. in a two in one square block, basically, for Correct. lack of a better term. And so that's a concern, and we're trying to work on that. But thank you for being here. Thank you. Just to know, in relationship, um, you know, all know probably Katie Townsley, and she is my neighbor across the street, and I've known her since she was a little girl. And um, her parents are my next door neighbors, and uh, Jake and Ann Townsley, and they are wonderful folks. So I just, you know, just so you have that relationship, um, that's why I brought it here, because no one else in our community were able to come, and so I said, I'll go. So thank you. Did you uh, Delegate Tomlinson. It, it's okay. <laughs> and these are all out of city limits, correct? Yes, we don't live in the city, yeah, the city yep. limits, um, you know. That's what I thought. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's, that, that's exactly right. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you for being here. Okay, we have next on our list uh, Keith Benfer with the Liquor Board. I think he was. Oh, he, he, he's good. He, okay. He was with Mr. Brown. Okay. Uh, Mayor Jones, you're up. Okay. Thank you. Mayor Jones from Town and Union Bridge. Uh, sorry I didn't get there sooner, but we are a, a very limited staff with a, only a thousand population, and it's, it's the smallest town in Union Bridge in Carroll County. Uh, when you look at the projects that we've been going through for the last several years, uh, I don't anticipate you to take the time right now to look at all of them. But I did highlight some of the projects that we uh, do need funding on. Uh, first project, uh, we're running about $87,000 short on the uh, community center playground and walkway improvements. We were like this, the school board or the school was talking about, we have some playground equipment that is uh, obsolete when it came down to uh, inspections last year. We had to remove some of this play, that playground equipment. and. Uh, this project, you see uh, the project was $181,000. Uh, what we have done is uh, put in for a program open space. We got some money through there, and uh, we are hoping to get some more, but we're not sure we're going to get that because it goes between the eight municipalities every year, and you split up your money. We do have uh, volunteers that are going to do this work because we have to tear all the, the mulch out that's in there and put down this new rubber coating that you have to use that's that make you use on playgrounds nowadays. So we have volunteers to help uh, finish this project if we are, are able to get this $87,000 in the funding. Our next project is uh, a track loader with a mowing attachment that we're, uh, we put a grant in for. That's $80,000. And um, if you've ever been to Union Bridge, you'll see, I know um, Delegate Bruchet's been there, but we have one of the nicest walking trails in the county and uh, just to keep this mode and our stormwater management projects mode, it's going to make it a lot easier. We have this, uh, it's, it's actually a skid steer, and we put a mower on the front where we can get around the trees. Uh, when that project was put in back in the like, year 2000, people came out and helped volunteer to put trees in. Nobody ever anticipated putting them in rows. They just put trees everywhere. So when you're out there, it's almost hard to, without having something, and you can have a, a mower in front of you to go around and mow these trees. Uh, it you is, you uh, need some goats. Yes. <laughs> it is a 1.2 mile uh, track that goes around. It's off the road. We have millions of people a year that uh, I'd like to have. If I could put a toll on there and charge five cents for every mile walking on there, I could pay for all these projects. But it's, <laughs> it's well used every day of the week. Uh, and uh, you can see down through here, our next project is uh, security of our town office. Um, we did get some money through the county, and we want to make sure our building is secure. I mean, you know, have seen, uh, like Tony Town had an instance a couple of years ago where a gentleman tried to drive through the building. We want to make sure our building is more secure. We do have bulletproof glass where you come into one door, but we want to go and make our other doors more secure and make our building more secure to make sure that uh, we're taking care of not just our employees that are at the office, but when we have council meetings when people come in and they're safe. Um, we, uh, last year, with your help, we did get secure $5 million for some uh, uh, upgrades to our water treatment plant, and we 
are working on that right now. And it's going to be another additional $10 million to build this plant out completely because we have a plant that was built in 1965. And so we, we are going to build a whole new plant so that uh, we can take care of some of our projects. Our other thing is we have a lot of uh, artifacts for the town of Union Bridge. We do have a building right next to our town office that we would like to renovate and make our museum. And we're looking at a, a rest, uh, estimate of about $1.5 million to do this building. Uh, we have some, it's a nice brick building, but we have to go in and do a lot of renovations. We have to do, it used to be a pump house, and we have to go in and have the, the building uh, secured underneath and everything like that. But we have artifacts that goes back from the town, was incorporated in 1872, and we just would like to have a place to uh, display these pieces. So uh, when you get the time, you can look at the, the write up on the rest of these projects. And I'm always available if you have any questions. Thank you very much for your time and thank you for having us today. Oh, Mayor, before you go, I want to give you recognition for your lifelong commitment to your community. I believe it was your father started a business. I think it was the first African-American business established in Carroll County. You served in the town council. You have, you served as mayor, you served as a commissioner. You have devoted your life to that community and you deserve the greatest recognition and respect from us. Thank you. Thank you. Just as pass. <laughs> Like these gentlemen, these gentlemen back here as of uh, August or uh, October, I have 50 years in the fire company as a volunteer. Oh, awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor. The, mayor. the Mayor says, you can skip the applause, just give me the money. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, and maybe you could put a tip jar out, you know, yeah, on, that, you on that walking trail, you know, volunteer. Um, we have next Mark Dyer from Sykesville. Good afternoon. Okay. I'm not here to ask you for money. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here to, yes, I'm here to ask you for law. In my previous life, before I went into local politics, I was a computer scientist, dealt with technology. A couple of things you can never have too much of, computing power, and bandwidth. So as I read technical journals still to this day, I read an article in the UK that all new construction must have gigabit ethernet connectivity. So I marched over to our town manager, figuratively, uh, called him on the phone and said, we ought to do that. And I also mentioned to the people in the county, we ought to mandate that people have gigabit connectivity. And I found out that we can't do that because that would require a law. So I'm here to ask you to make such a law. If the Brits can mandate gigabit ethernet for their citizens, how can we ask for anything less? We've been around since 1837, but we're still vital. And today we are trying to maintain our technology as good as anywhere in the world. I know this is somewhat symbolic in that there are still places in our county not yet supported by any broadband connection. And we're working that. <laughs> but what, what I'm trying to do is make sure that if someone wants to build a new home or a new business or tear it down to the slab and build back up again, whoever moves in will have connectivity because those children who live there need education. So I'm asking you for a law that would allow zoning boards and our planning commission to mandate that. If I am wrong that it is not required, because I was assured it was, I would just like a re ruling on that so I could hand to a a planning commission say, oh, you can mandate it. This is part of an existing law. So anyway, I'm not asking for money. I'm asking for a law, and I'm more than willing to accept any questions. This gentleman seemed to have one. Oh, no, I'd like to make a comment, though. Thank you very much. Um, it's another, I guess the only other pet peeve I've already had right now is, is this, The monopolies that are given to the cable companies and not covering all accounts. And in today's world, with all the Zoom and the pandemic and kids at home and yada, 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 and it could be a half mile away and you can't get cable. Um, I have a house, we have, I have two of the satellite times because one only works half the time. So I have two and they're both crap. 
That's a technical term. I'm familiar with it. Yeah. So, so, yeah, we've. Yeah. I, I think there should be a law that everybody in the community should have availability of high speed internet. Well, well, actually, I'd like to well, come in here as a member of the Carroll County Regulatory Com Cable Regulatory Committee. Because we do, we had a meeting last night, and one of our, we are desperately trying to make sure that every citizen in this county has internet. The problem is you can't go to a company and say, by the way, I want you to go off and do everything I want because, well, it's called freedom and it's ugly, but we are encouraging it in every way possible. I don't want to go into detail, but it right. is a fact we're bringing so, in other companies. We're trying to make it happen. Yeah, so the broad, rural broadband is a huge issue, which we could talk about for a while. Maybe we could talk out after the meeting, but there is a lot of, there's a lot of, that's happening now with it, but it's still a long way off, which is nobody likes to hear. It's almost like rural electrification. It really is. So uh, I don't know about mandating it in all, in all, uh, in all new construction, but well, I'm talking we, about the connectivity, sir. I'm the not connectivity. saying that no, we're going to a company and go, you've got to, I'm saying that when, whenever a company shows up and says, I got my data fiber, they don't go, oh, what do you do with it? Well, I plug it in. <laughs> I gotcha, you understood. Think about it, you have water, you have electricity, you have gas, codes, all I'm asking for is a, a connectivity. Data code, connection gotcha. data code, where someone shows up with a wire and goes, what do I do? You go like that and they go, oh, thanks, click. All right. And the lights come on. Uh, I'm banging the drum in any group I can. I've spoken to the MML, and I'm speaking to you. This is my crusade now, and I'm trying to make it happen. Uh, all I'm asking, again, is either a ruling that says, no, you can make this happen, or a law that says, thou shalt make it happen. Thank you very much. Sorry, Justin. It, it's so needed. I mean, TV's going to that. I know. If you don't have internet, you're not going to watch TV. I know. Yes. Well, we hear we hear from a lot of our constituents about that all the time. There's so. been some progress made, but it's some very progress. slow, and we need to keep pushing it for sure. But we're going to have solar farms. So we'll all righty. Uh, next one um, on our list here is Mr. Pete Samios. I'm Pete Samios from the Carroll County Licensed Beverage Association. And I'm here to request a change in the law. Um, about two years ago, the Supreme Court came down with a ruling in the Tennessee case that uh, basically outlawed residency requirements that are tied to uh, length of stay in the county or uh, voting or paying taxes or any of that kind of stuff. So the Liquor Board just voted for their regulations to uh, we, we forever we had to have be a Carroll County resident the whole license uh, and because of that the Supreme Court ruling they voted to make it a state um, you just have to be a resident of the state with no requirement for two years or any of those restrictions uh, but current law uh, says in Carroll County you have to be a uh, local account, county resident to hold a license. So I think that we need to put a law in to change that to the state. So uh, I, wrote, I, I typed or I printed it out and I'll give a couple copies to the chairman here. It's got the, uh, the number. Yeah, we can put it in the yeah, I hope. <laughs> okay. Yep. And, uh, Good idea. Yeah, it's pretty. If you have any questions, I'll try to answer them. We'll get cop and we'll get copies to everyone. I don't have enough copies for you all, so. Yeah, that's, that's yeah, so, uh, so the liquor board changed the regulation, liquor board, but we didn't change the they, law. Uh, yeah, they voted, but really, state law supersedes liquor board regulation. And, so and what the they really did is they didn't do anything. Yeah, so that's the way I look at it. But I mean, of course, they'll, they'll go by their regulation unless somebody challenges them. So and we should try to avoid that. Eventually. Try to avoid that. Right. That's all. Okay. I, I don't think they'll disagree with that. I was hoping they would be here. So I talked to Jeff Kelly at Wednesday, and he's the one that told me he, we should clean it up. Okay. okay. Are you going to vote on this as a board? And I, I, I will just, just let us know. It. Yeah, it, yeah. I, they really Seems shouldn't have a problem. They already voted on it. Okay. <laughs> so, okay. I mean, that's their policy. I'm just trying okay. to bring law into compliance with their policy. Okay. 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 Very good, thank Thanks. you. Any questions? 
Okay. Last person. And our last speaker for today, Angelica Bailey, is it? Thupari. Thupari. Yeah, it's new. <laughs> Hi everyone, Angelica Bailey Thupari. I'm with the Maryland Municipal League. I'm our legislative director. Thank you very much for having us. I will try to be quick, um, especially since this is the first time in 13 years MML is not asking for money now that HUR is finally passed. Um, so we wanted to meet with all of you this evening. Thank you again for your time. Unfortunately, our CEO, Teresa Coons, couldn't join us. Um, she's on the transition team for the incoming comptroller, and they had a last minute meeting scheduled. So you're all stuck with me. Um, but we, you know, we'll keep it quick. This year, one of our top priorities deals with police accountability boards and administrative charging committees. You'll remember a few years ago, 2021, um, House Bill 671 passed the big police reform suite of legislation. Um, part of that included the establishment of police accountability boards and administrative charging committees on the county level as part of a new police disciplinary framework. Fantastic, no objection, except municipalities were completely left out. Not sure if it was an oversight, but, and Senator, I'm sorry, I know you heard this pitch yesterday. Thank you for bearing with me. Um, but, <laughs> <laughs> um, but we do have 88 out of our 157 municipalities that have their own police departments that are exclusive and independent from their county counterparts. So that's 88 municipalities that are they do not have an official seat at the table. They are not officially part of this process. So this year we're asking for a simple tweak, just enabling legislation, just allowing any municipality that has a police department, has the resources and the inclination and the emotional energy to undertake this to go ahead and create their own police accountability board and administrative charging committee. MAKO has no opposition. We've met with uh, presiding officers, leadership, and committee chairs, so we very much hope for your support. We are optimistic that we can get some meaningful municipal representation this year. I'm happy to answer any questions, and I also have a one-pager for you all if you're interested. Great. <coughs> Questions? We'd love to have that. Thank you so much for being here. I'm sure we'll be seeing a lot of you yes, in Annapolis. <laughs> um, and I believe Delegate Tomlinson said that perhaps Ms. Barry might have some follow up information for us that quickly from the earlier discussion. She's efficient. No, thank you. I just wanted to clarify that it does not, um, our proposal does not impact the congressional or the legislative districts. It's simply, like, all the, those types of lines are staying. Um, it's just simply moving the commissioner districts, changing their colors um, on our map. So. Okay. Oh, I, a question, follow, follow up question. If, if we did, if we did this, how would it be communicated? One concern I have is I don't, I know every voter knows exactly who they voted for for county commissioner and remembers it for four years. But I mean, in all seriousness, how would we? How would that be communicated? I want to be sure we publicize if we're thinking about doing this, so people know to comment. But also, how would it be communicated if we did make that change? Yes, yeah, so we're required to send out voter notification cards to the voters anytime we make a change to their polling location or to something like their commissioner district. We would highlight that in the um, the mail and it would also go on our social media website and sample ballots when it comes time for that okay thank you very much thank you thank, thank you thank thanks you. for getting that so quickly um since we do have our state's attorney here i didn't know if you had anything that you wanted to say well the only thing that uh, i would say is god speed to you all do you want me to go to the microphone, go to the microphone. Yes. <laughs> and identify yourself, identify yourself for the there. record <laughs> Give us some homespun uh, stories. Uh, the, uh, the only thing I would say to you all is, you know, thank you all very much for going to uh, Annapolis, representing the good people of Carroll County and fighting a good fight for us. Uh, you know, the other day when you started, Monday at noon, I looked at my, what was it? Wednesday. Or Wednesday at noon. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> but in any event, whatever day it was, uh, you know, I had a uh, uh, delegate withdraw uh, for about five minutes and it went away. So <laughs> hang in there. God bless you. Well, thank you. And we, we very much enjoyed serving with you. Um, and just, just wanted to say I, I have a very good friend in the audience I've known for 20 years, I think at least, who uh, gave me my own gavel. <laughs> uh, so we don't get out of line. Yeah. <laughs> um, so thank you, John Wafer, my very You're good all. friend. Um, if there's nothing else for the good of the order, does, does anyone else want to speak to anything? I will just add that Mr. Wafer has known me in this room longer than anyone else here. So I'm glad you're here. We used to sign away from here. 
Yes. <laughs> well, thank, thanks to everyone for coming out. You know that we're always available to speak with you at any time. Um, if there's no other folks that want to come up and say anything or speak, we will uh, entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And I'm going to.